Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, and uh, to one and all to have listening in today. This is Singapore Channel of Singapore FinTech Festival 2020, and this session, SME Go FinTech, is exciting. We've got 45 minutes of non stop action. I've got with me uh, four distinguished guests, uh, but before that, my name is Mark Leong. I represent Singapore FinTech uh, Association. Well, that's my uh, volunteer job. I also have a full time job with Maybank Singapore. And uh, let me just uh, quickly introduce the, the four guests here this afternoon. We've got Victor Lee, uh, CEO of CIMB, a uh, gentleman in the black suit. We've got Paul Haji, CEO and co founder of Horangi. And I've got to do this. Horangi is a Korean, a tiger. Olivia Sia, co founder, CEO of Frexter. And we have got James Crosby, CEO of Fancor. Now, uh, great to have all these four gentlemen here joining us this afternoon. All male power, all male dominance. Uh, we're going to start off probably uh, this whole session here. The next 45 minutes is going to be fun. Let's start with Victor. Victor, uh, COO CIMB. Um, yeah, one of the newest CEO in the Singapore banking system. Uh, tell us about your journey, Victor, to your current position as bank CEO and your impressions thus far of uh, Singapore FinTech Festival, even the Singapore fintech scene generally Victor. yeah so um thanks mark so i'm a pretty much a dinosaur now you know 25 years uh, in the banking industry um i don't think i would be employable in the in a lot of fintechs these days um but this 25 years you know, started obviously with i think pretty humble background didn't come from a rich family but really worked very hard put in you know 18 so no, 16 18 hours a day sometimes um, spent in Singapore, but actually enjoyed most of my time outside Singapore in Malaysia, um, Taiwan, and a good part of the time also in China. So banking was uh, not exactly what my parents wanted me to do. They wanted me to be a doctor or an accountant. <laughs> or a doctor. But I thought, you know, banking was easy, actually. It's just a marketing company, marketing financial products. Um, and then, that was just the beginning 25 years ago, and here we are today. And I think banking really is um, a people business uh, more than everything else. And underneath uh, the people business, really, it's technology, infrastructure. Uh, and I always tell people, hire well, hire right. Uh, and when you've got a good team, everything just falls in place. Um, and just like everyone else, um, <clears throat> there are three groups of share, uh, stakeholders, right? Our customers, our staff, uh, and our shareholders, right? And, um, we interested to note that, you know, with the fintechs and the bank tax coming through, um, ROE is under a lot of pressure for the banks. Uh, gone are the days, you know, double digit ROEs with the pandemic, you see the ROEs falling to below 10%. Yeah. So, I mean, moving into the uh, impressions of the fintech festival, um, we got, came into COVID, I think in February. Um, everybody was just shell shocked when we got into it. Uh, I think thankfully, globally, everybody fell into, into position, especially the governments, especially the banks. You know, we, we would become systemic uh, issue if we didn't facilitate uh, all the financial programs uh, governments were dishing. So, so really, uh, when, when, when I looked at the fintech and everything virtual, everything now is 24-7, um, this is really the COVID new norm. Uh, and everyone is pivoting. Right today, 50% of our people continue to work from home. So I think it's refreshing actually that the FinTech Festival is totally virtual. Uh, it's so major. Uh, and I, I look at every all human beings pivoting so quickly. Um, yeah, so so really within the bank, we are also, you know, the last 10 months rethinking all our di digital strategies. We're accelerating, we're, we're over investing, you know, so that we are far more digital than we can be. Uh, take on the world, right? And with the new licenses coming up, 
um, for us, uh, ever more important. Um, we are not a local bank, we are a foreign bank, but we're nimble. We don't have huge uh, rentals and costs to deal with. Um, so, so, so with FinTech Festival and us pivoting, um, actually looking forward to a lot of cool stuff. And actually, all my one down my management team, everyone is you know curating uh, and meeting people uh, online this 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 week actually. Yeah, ma. yeah. So, Japan's Twitter for those thoughts. Uh, no, you're not dancer for sure. Twenty five years is it's 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 uh it's just nice, perfect banking experience, <laughs> and uh, the fintech will fit right in. I think. Uh, and we're gonna talk a bit more later on in the uh, in the rest of the evening. And uh, let's have uh, Paul Haji, CEO of co-founder of Horangi. Paul, sorry if I pronounce your name wrongly. Is it Paul Haji or is it Paul Had? Can I get some thoughts? Uh, Haji. That's correct. Haji, yeah. okay. Paul, uh, you are a cybersecurity compliance guy. Tell us about, uh, you know, you, you I, I've, I've read your bio, you a serial entrepreneur. I think you started in very young age, your college days, uh, work in many countries across the world. Um, Counterintuitively, you are actually an engineer by training. So you are taken the less certain, less structured, less uh, um, sure path. Tell us about this whole journey and uh, why does, uh, does this make you happy? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. So um, yeah, as you mentioned, I have started a couple of companies and some of them uh, successful, some of them uh, uh, not so successful, um, which I think is part of every entrepreneur's journey. Um, but I also got an opportunity to work for the government uh, right out of college in the US. Uh, and then I worked for a big tech firm in the US called Palantir, which I'm sure some people have heard of for for about seven years as well. Um, so I have gotten to experience both sides of um, both uh, the entrepreneurial side uh, as well as uh, um, uh, working for a, a tech company or end governments as well. Um, but I think for me, like generally, I, I've always haven't been very risk averse. So I've always been quite sort of uh, in, interested in things that where there is risk um, and trying to see in opportunities kind of in the uh, situations where there is downside. Um, but it's always been a part of me. So like even when I was a kid, like, um, you know, growing up in the U.S. and like the neighborhoods, like there's a lot of grass cutting and uh, in the wintertime, a lot of snow shoveling going on. And, and every every year I would be knocking on my neighbor's doors asking them if they would like me to uh, cut their grass or um, uh, shovel their sidewalk or their their driveway. Um, so I think it's always been something that's ingrained in me, just uh, building things, creating things. Um, and then that kind of brings me to the engineering. And I think like, you know, engineering, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that, of course, come from that field. Um, but ultimately, I think well, the reason I enjoy engineering is because you're building something, right? Um, which is not really any different than uh, building a company, right? Uh, uh, and in our case, like we're using software to do that. Uh, so I do get to experience uh, both uh, the uh, engineering aspects of, of my, my studies, but also the, the building aspect, which is, I think is ultimately what I really enjoy. Um, yeah, and I think that for me, like my favorite part about entrepreneurship is, is both helping people and building things. And I, I, I luckily get opportunity to do, up, do both. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So, so I like this part here. He's kind of using his, his training as an engineer to kind of build stuff. And he uses an excuse to say, I'm starting a business. I'm building a business. I like it, Paul. We're going to talk more <laughs> in a while. time. Nice, Paul. Oliver, uh, Oliver Sia. Uh, I think Oliver is a property guy, real estate guy. Um, today's co-founder and CEO of Fraxter. Very interesting. I'm going to ask him how you come and come up with Fraxter. Is it from Fraction? Oliver, you have been in real estate business uh, for a period of time. Um, you have pivoted into this totally quite different thing. Maybe not different, but uh, prop tech, if I may. Uh, blockchain prop, prop tech of Fraxter and uh, together with your partner, Rachel Teo. Tell us about uh, uh, this whole journey and uh, what is Fraxter all about? Hi, yeah. So I, I didn't start off in the real estate uh, profession. Mm. I was a military pilot. Uh, in the Singapore Air Force for many, many years. Right. Uh, but So my real estate journey started really about 18 years ago when I bought my first uh, property. Uh, back then, I mean, there, there are many barriers to entry to buying a, an investment property, uh, not only in Singapore, but anywhere in the world. You've got a high capital outlay, uh, you've got the illiquidity of the uh, investment, and also the access to good uh, quality products. Um, so when I left the uh, Air Force, uh, I've been raising uh, capital for real estate investment projects and development projects in Singapore. Uh, we partner up with uh, Rachel Teo of uh, Daniel Teo and Associates. Uh, so, um, so they had a very similar idea of uh, democratizing uh, real estate investment. Um, so with that in mind, we, we, you know, we, we form uh, Fraxter, which uh, stands for Fractional Investor. Uh, to allow the really a small investor players to to join in to break uh, institutional grade uh, real estate investments. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so, but Oliver, 18 years in property is not a short time. So you, let me see, you started at the age of, you started at the age of five, right? So five plus 18, that makes you 23. Five. And Fester has been around for five years. <laughs> right. has been around for about uh, four years. Uh, four years, so, okay. But, yeah, but we have only uh, started operations uh, since last year, June. Okay. Um, yeah, that's because of uh, MAS regulations uh, around right. this uh, these products. Okay, you have you have got some uh, ventures already, some pro projects done up. Uh, we're going to speak yes. a bit about it shortly. And, yeah, and the audience will surely be very interested because property is kind of a uh, hey, you know, it's a key play in Singapore. Let's move on to James, James Crosby, CEO of Fancor. James, you're all about data management. Um, Twenty years in uh, uh, software and tech. Uh, a play, James. You have lived in major cities: London, Zurich, Sydney, and now and now Singapore. I'm going to put you in the spot. So, which of these four is your favourite city, and why? <laughs> yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, I mean, each one of those actually has its kind of pros and cons. Uh, you know, Sydney is, is such a livable in city, but then it's it's kind of sometimes a bit tricky to to get around as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's got these beautiful beaches, but that to, to get into the city centre from Bondi can take you, you know, uh, an hour and a half sometimes on some days. So I, I, I'm not just saying this. Singapore uh, is, is is actually topping the list. It's my my favourite place to live. I, I can see our, ourselves living here for many more years to come. It's it's got a really good ecosystem for the fintech space as well, which is why you know, the Singapore fintech festival does so well every year and is, is growing and growing. Um, so yeah, it's it's a great place to, to to have your company headquartered in the fintech space. Okay, James, you're not telling the truth. You're telling me it's Singapore. Fine, if you go to Sydney, you're gonna say it's Sydney, huh? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll let you on the hook uh, just for once. All right, yeah. <laughs> come back to you and give you some punishing questions. <laughs> Go talk more later. Now, uh, this stuff, <laughs> and we, we, we're talking about uh, SMEs. Uh, 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 go fintech. Uh, I think we're going to come back to Victor. Uh, Victor, you have uh, I've read in some of your press releases that uh, the SME segment features will feature prominently in CIMB's plans in Singapore and even the region. I think it's always been a big play. I think SMEs in just in just about any part of the world, in Singapore especially, is about uh, close to fifty percent of the GDP. Its contribution workforce. I think sixty five percent of the workforce in Singapore. Uh, works with uh, uh, an SME. Um, now, this is SME going fintech. You're going to get a lot more SME uh, customers, the small medium enterprises going digital, going fintech, uh, embracing technology at the highest level. Now, does this at all change your approach or strategy to serving SMEs? And uh, uh, what, are, what are your thinking, thought process behind, you know, collaborating with these SMEs or even fintech vendors uh, to propel your SME business? Yeah. Business for, yeah. for, for so I guess, I guess um, like I said, right at the beginning of the COVID, it felt like doomsday for everybody. Um, people in the hospitality, people in tourism, uh, in aviation, uh, whether you're a large corporate or you're SME, in those three sectors or segments, uh, you feel that it's almost the end of the world. Um, but, you know, as we call it in Chinese, you know, the SMEs are like a cockroach. You know, you can't kill a cockroach. Right, and we will survive, and they will survive. Um, so I think um, really second quarter, um, COVID hit ASEAN very hard. Uh, um, everything was in lockdown. You know, today we have come out of the eye of the storm, um, and a lot of SMEs are back on track. Right, and and people who have not pivoted to new normals, um, yes, I think they have to close, and that is the nature of the beast. Right, uh, not all SMEs survive. In fact. 80% of SMEs actually do not survive after the, the first three years, right? And that's a reality. Uh, but that kind of mindset that, you know, they, they have decided to do a startup or to, or to become an SME, uh, I think that spirit is really important to bring the entrepreneurial, to bring a country to the next stage, right? And like, right, like you rightly pointed out, I think 50 to 80% of a country's GDP is really propelled uh, by the SMEs, right? So I think for, for me, what I've really seen, uh, the actually the last 10 months is um, SMEs being very flexible, uh, being very nimble. Everybody has really pivoted. Um, and as a result of which uh, banks or, or providers of, of services to SMEs, everyone really has to digitize, right? And even brick and mortar restaurants and all this, 
how they have done delivery. I know of restaurants that have done delivery very well. Um, and today they are even expanding. Right? The shopping malls are not empty. In fact, if you look at ground floor shopping malls these days, uh, it is not the big hall. Oh, it's actually restaurants occupy the floor, ground floor. So for consumer behaviors um, have all changed. Uh, table sizes are no longer 10, you know, not tables are two, three, five. So, so if you, if you pivot uh, well, if you pivot fast, um, you really can catch on actually a lot, a lot of opportunities. Um, and if I come back to to, to banking, um, given that there are now five virtual bank licenses, uh, four virtual bank licenses coming out, uh, what what do customers really want? To expect? What will they be expecting more? They want better experiences. They want frictionless integrations. I think that's going to be key. Uh, and banks need to use data to get a lot more. Data. Uh, into their customers. And that's really where I think uh, big financial institutions, you know, would have little gap uh, in their offerings. And that's where the FinTech, the virtual bank can come in uh, to fill those gaps. So, so I think um, the SMEs out there will be even more toy for choices. Um, and there will be more competition, prices will come down. Um, and whoever really knows the customer journey, nail customer experience, you know, they are going to win a lot more customers. Um, and I, if I come back to, to CIMB as a bank, uh, and that's what we have really done, right? Digitize the front line, or just people can interact with our customers far more efficiently. You know, whatever is happening in the branch today, in the next couple of months, we will almost completely have all branch services uh, digitized into our app. So I think that's something we really need to do. Uh, and if we do not do, we ourselves will die. Hmm. And, and some other better play will come. So, and and I, I also recall uh, in really Q2, you know, very quickly with a, a chatbot company out there, within the course of three weeks, we rolled out our first what we call COVID chatbot, right? There was a lot of confusion in the market. You know, everybody was throwing programs. Uh, every government was giving uh, COVID relief programs, but nobody knew how to tap on it, how to apply. Uh, and that's where, within a short period, uh, period of three weeks, we rolled out what we call Viva, uh, our COVID chatbot. And I think we won some awards for that. Uh, today, Eva has gone bilingual, you know, from English now, it's, 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 you can speak to it in Malay. Yeah. Um, so, for us, it's, you know, uh, delivering a service to the customers in a digital way. Uh, and really, the other thing that we'll be continuing doing is partnerships. Uh, partnership with a lot of tech companies, accounting uh, software companies, HR software companies, and even a lot of uh, e commerce uh, shop builders. Right. So, so I think we are also really uh, keeping ahead of the game uh, so that we provide more and more services for customers uh, and really want to become an integral part of their uh, trusted partner. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Victor. So, so I hear uh, pivot. I hear client journeys. I hear uh, the, the chatbot. I hear partnerships. Uh, so it's well entrenched. Uh, uh, really, really going to the ecosystem of, of technology and even fintech. So, so congrats on your awards as well, or winning it. Uh, and on, on the spirit of uh, technology and fintech even, uh, we're going to go jump straight to Paul. Paul, you you you, you run uh, Parangi, and uh, I think cybersecurity and compliance is, is your key area. Now, um, if I want to do this, if banks or even SMEs or even corporates are embracing technology in a big, big way, I, I know that uh, with Behorangi Warden, you are cloud-based cybersecurity and you have you already secured and are serving some of the large guys like Gojek, Faith Pay, uh, Property Guru. Now, now how, does, uh, how does your product or service work? And uh, does it only apply to the large guys or, or uh, even to the SMEs? Yeah, sure. Uh, great question. Appreciate that, Mark. Um, yeah, so Harangi uh, Warden is actually a multi-cloud uh, cloud security posture management solution. Um, but essentially what that means is it uh, looks for misconfigurations for security and compliance issues in the public cloud. So right now we're integrated with uh, AWS and GCP and are soon launching uh, Azure and Alibaba. Um, but essentially, it, it looks through the different configurations in a multi-cloud environment or a, a single cloud environment, identifies those security issues, uh, and of course, allows you to comply with uh, local or uh, regional compliance standards um, like MES TRM or um, uh, MES Cyber Hygiene or RMIT in Malaysia or uh, OJECA's requirements in, in Indonesia. 
Um, yeah. So like in terms of like whether it helps the big or the small guys. So like, uh, as you mentioned, we do work with a lot of tech companies but because, of course, they're almost all based in the cloud. But uh, we also work with a lot of large financial institutions as well as large uh, insurers because um, we kind of focus on the regulated industries because of the compliance piece of our product. Um, but when we first built our product, just like the cloud service providers, um, what we try to do is enable it, uh, all companies of all sizes, the ability to secure their infrastructure. Um, so the pricing model scales up with usage. So for we have companies as small as 10 people using the product, and we have companies as big as 10,000 uh, people using the product. So, um, you know, it really doesn't matter, and the pricing scales to adjust based upon the usage of their cloud environment, um, which generally, I think, uh, when a company is using a, a, a cloud, um, the cloud also scales with the growth of their business. Um, so it kind of aligns incentives from the uh, organization in terms of investing in their security, uh, uh, along with the growth of their business, which uh, ultimately uh, in security, if you can uh, establish that, it's really important because, um, you know, yeah, the earlier you put security in, the better off uh, you are uh, as an organization. Yeah, so, so Paul, just, just to just add to that point, because uh, Victor mentioned as well with, with the whole the, the whole last nine, ten months when the pandemic was at its full blown, full steam and everything, and also companies have have, have gone digital. Uh, the e-commerce uh, portion of life has, has kind of like just pivoted up and just boom and boom up and everything. Uh, digital transformation, digital adoption, big time in Singapore, uh, big time in Southeast Asia. Has that uh, positively affected your company's business or, or and, and what are your views on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think like, um, you know, given uh, what's going on in the world, a lot of people are making the switch uh, towards digitalizing their businesses in some way if they're not already digitalized. Um, and if they're already digitalized, they're starting to think more about security. Um, uh, if you look at every economic downturn, security is one of those things that does creep up uh, during an economic downturn, mainly because people are more concerned with protecting uh, whatever assets they have throughout that time and whether that's like financially protecting it or, uh, you know, securing it uh, from security, physical, cyber, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, you do see it go up, uh, uh, not drastically, but uh, a little bit. Um, so I think like we're lucky enough to be uh, not uh, someone who's um, benefiting from the crisis, but someone who can still sustain a business throughout it. Um, so I think from that part, we are lucky. And uh, actually, um, a lot of companies are switching, of course, as we are all uh, or a lot of us are working from home. Uh, they're having to build out infrastructure in the cloud um, uh, and they don't know how to do it. Right. They, they've had to make this switch very fast. Um, and security and compliance is, of course, one of the biggest things that's important to their organization when they do make that switch to the cloud. Um, so we are getting a lot of customers that are sort of uh, coming to us to help them along this journey uh, and using our product to identify those those issues, fix them, because uh, we just launched uh, one click remediation, which essentially not only can we identify the security issues, they can actually just fix them with a click of a button. Um, so that's become a really big feature for us to allow them to secure their cloud infrastructure. And with the scalable pricing, it's not uh, something that's expensive, of course, until you move your entire uh, infrastructure over, which you know kind of aligns the interest of uh, that organization uh, as well as with us. Um, yeah, and I think we also, uh, about a year ago, made a, a focus on uh, focusing more on regulated businesses um, because of the compliance aspect of our products. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, in, in those um, businesses, you know, um, uh, there are uh, regulatory requirements for uh, cybersecurity, um, which of course does help us uh, get that budget because uh, it is a line item in their existing budget. You know, oftentimes it won't grow very much uh, during our crisis, but of course the budget is still there, which is, uh, you know, uh, something better than that what some people have, right? Very nice. Always, always, always nice. Always nice to hear a, a, a fintech guy doing so well. Ten from ten people to ten thousand people. Very nice. I like it. Uh, and yes, uh, the compliance costs as um, those who are in the business would know. Any business for them, not just financial services, is just going up, going up higher and higher. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to do really well uh, because compliance is is a shoe in these days. Uh, I'm going to take take it uh, take the gears off a little bit uh, to move on to something a little bit more. Um, Hmm, a bit more close to the Singaporean's heart property. Uh, we talk about Frexter, uh, fractional investment. Oliver, um, now, now Frexters, if, if I read correctly and I've done my research a little bit, uh, your, your co-investment of bite-sized ownership concept, uh, uh, you have deployed, uh, if it's, it's been successful, uh, you have deployed the monies and uh, over several residential projects and commercial buildings in Singapore, if I read correctly, Singapore, Berlin, even Melbourne, right? Uh, uh, right, uh, very close to Sydney. <laughs> now, uh, how 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 challenging has it been to 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 acquire investors? I understand that uh, right now you're moving on AI on the credit investors, not artificial yeah. intelligence. I know this is a SFF week, right? Uh, credit investors. How difficult has it been? What are the comments been for the investors uh, for AI guys? And uh, are you thinking of moving out into the masses, uh, the guys with uh, you know less than a million dollars? I, I think uh, a product like uh, or a platform like a Fractor really serves the uh, non AI market very well, but I, I think uh, because of uh, 
regulation, and then we want to progress uh, step by step. That's why we have uh, initially launched for accredited investors. Uh, but in the future, definitely, we will go down to the uh, non-accredited uh, investor space. Um, so what, what we have been uh, getting from the uh, accredited investors are that, you know, they, they really love the idea that they can diversify their portfolio because the minimum investment on our platform is about 20000 But if you go to the bigger funds out there, you know, you're looking at quarter million, half a million, or some even $1 million. And that really puts a lot of these uh, accredited investors, you know, out, out, out of uh, reach in, in, for all these uh, properties, projects. Um, so when, when, when a platform like Frexter first came out, I, I think uh, we, we had a lot of uh, people signing up uh, who are non-AI and then, you know, we had to push them away. Uh, yeah, but, but I, I think uh, right now we, 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 we have uh, funded, I think in the last nine months, we have raised more than a nine, nine million Singapore dollars worth. So that's a right on from a circuit breaker up to, I think we just did the uh, checks today. Uh, we, we have raised more than nine million uh, Singapore dollars. Uh, and we only started operations last uh, June, uh, mm. so I, I think I think uh, that that is a very good uh, indicator that you know there, there are people are moving away uh, from you know traditional type of fund structures and in, in coming onto a platform like Frexter to to invest in uh, real estate products, and that also gives us the uh, you know the the courage to actually take on more projects because you know some of our projects are actually in such uh, high demand they actually get oversubscribed within the first three days of uh, launching. Um, so, so that that is a very good uh, indicator that uh, I mean, I mean, people want to invest, but you know, where, how are they going to invest, right? So, so we feel that a, a platform uh, will definitely push us forward. And also, Frexter is a blockchain uh, enabled platform, so we issue digital securities uh, on the platform. Uh, so, we we feel that that is the next uh, leap in terms of how uh, you know people can invest in uh, real estate assets, uh, and so. Yeah, so definitely we 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 want to push that along, uh, and in the future possibly uh, touch the uh, non-accredited investor uh, as well as uh, launch uh, an exchange where people can trade uh, their units uh, of uh, digital tokens. Oliver, so 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 I I I'm I'm quite curious, and also for the audience tuning in, they are curious. Yep. Um, so we are we're comparing Frexter's uh, business model with the likes of the traditional stuff, as in like we're just buying a property straight off, buying a property yep. shares, buying REITs, right? Now, how 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 can you uh, um, uh, how how attractive is this your, your business model versus, versus the traditional instruments, and uh, how does blockchain feature? I mean, you touched on it a little bit, okay. but for those who are uninitiated, uh, how does blockchain or this real ledger technology feature in your in your whole business model? Okay, so maybe let me just cover uh, maybe the first the direct uh, real estate investment. That's where you know you you just walk walk around the, the street and then you just point at something and they say, "Oh, I want to own yeah. this, I want to own this uh, property, right?" And then you you go into a conveyancing process. Uh, so that that in itself uh, requires a lot of effort. Firstly, the conveyancing process can take up to two three months. I mean, if any mm -hmm. any of us have bought uh, property before, even your own home, I mean, that's a substantially long period of time. And then uh, we need to put in a large capital outlay. Uh, maybe about 20 to 25 uh, percent in uh, upfront cash to to buy buy the property before you can take uh, a financing on the remaining amount. So that that in itself uh, creates certain barriers of entry to certain investors who don't have that upfront capital, and because of the illiquidity, right? I mean, if you you have invested in this uh, asset and then for you to divest, it's going to be very uh, difficult. Uh, that's why that's why I think with the Frexter platform, what we did was to create. Uh, bite-sized chunks of a, a piece of property. Uh, we take care of the financing uh, and then we allow people maybe in the future, once we are properly uh, licensed to do so, to allow people to trade on, a, on, an, ex on, a, on an exchange, right? That will give them some uh, uh, liquidity for their investment. The next uh, investment product, like what, what you pointed out, Mark, was uh, REITs. I think REITs are very good uh, investment products for retail investors. I mean, for an everyday investors, you know, they, they invest bite-sized amount. But actually, when, when you look at the product itself, it's, it's really an income uh, income yielding play, right? You, you, you buy a REIT, you get a fixed uh, a distribution uh, for, on, on that. Um, but you don't really get the big kicker at the end. So, uh, for example, when the REIT manager divests, a certain project, you don't suddenly see a big lump sum coming back to you in distributions. The read man, re manager usually just uh, redistributes that uh, into other assets, right? They acquire other assets just to increase uh, or try to maintain or increase the distribution per unit. 
Uh, and then this, uh, REITs have also a limitation where they only can invest about 10% in uh, development proper properties. Mm. Uh, and then if you see the development uh, market, that's where uh, most of the money in real estate is actually made. Uh, and then if you talk about listed uh, property developers, those are notoriously uh, known for paying very little dividend and they are trading at about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 price to book value. So to, to me, it's a very unfair play. Uh, you know, they, although they make money on the on their projects, you know they're not going to give you really a lot of uh, dividends for that. So we, we feel for Frexter, we, we we go into a direct uh, real estate play. So we see a property, we 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 securitize it uh, using SPVs, we put it on the platform, uh, and then using uh, blockchain uh, technology, we we uh, and smart contracts, we create uh, digital securities based off that. And I, I think for, for us, we have only scratched the surface of uh, using blockchain technology. We are, we are currently uh, a very uh, uh, one, a one platform play right now. But I, I think blockchain technology will allow us to really transcend the platform boundary, uh, transcend the uh, geographical boundaries, to really transact uh, and also to, 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 to manage uh, you know, an efficient secondary market anywhere in the world 24-7. So that's the benefits we, we saw when we uh, adopted uh, blockchain uh, technology. And, and, and I think a lot of platforms right now in the market have only scratched uh, the surface of uh, blockchain. We haven't really dived deep into the full capabilities of uh, blockchain uh, technology, which is something uh, Frexter intends to do in the coming uh, one year or two. Yeah, surely, because uh, in, we, we talk about single property, uh, even Malaysia or this region, we are notoriously uh, notoriously paper-based, right? Uh, it's, yes. it's so yeah. old school, central depository, uh, paper-based. Uh, uh, it's, 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 we are way behind, and I, and I sincerely, uh, and I go with that, we're just scratching, just just scratching it, right? The outside of that door, yes. uh, in this whole smart contract uh, let uh, property play. Thank you so much. This this is wonderful, James. I'm uh, gonna come back to you. Sorry, it took some time, James, because you you were you were bluffing on the Singapore being your favorite city. So I'm gonna come back to you now. <laughs> uh, you have EDM solutions. Um, this is about high data quality. You talk about that. You talk about exceptional management, reduce the risk, improve SLAs, uh, cost savings in your whole solution of for fan call, James. Um, tell us how exactly uh, are you doing this? How exactly are large companies or even or even SMEs uh, benefiting from your solution? Yes, that's a, a very good question. So um, we, we have a platform called Fencore EDM, which is a, a cloud-based uh, or, or on-premise based, if that was uh, preferred by our, by our client. But uh, generally, it's an, a cloud-based product that um, you know, helps connect to that financial institution's unique set of source and target systems. So every financial institution has different kind of data sets, maybe internally generated data, combining that with data that's bought from data vendors like Bloomberg or, or Refinitiv and all, all the others too. And then you can get into um, sometimes a bit of a, a mess with all this data that's being consumed. So our platform helps to validate the data as it's coming in. And one of the big differentiators for us is we're a, a no code platform. So there's no need to do any you know, complicated scripting or, or coding as part of our platform. It's much more intuitive and uh, drag and drop and so on. So that's, that's the goal is really to shorten those uh, notoriously long implementation time periods that you have at the beginning of a data management project. So we're trying to, you know, start talking about days and, and, and weeks rather than months and years in terms of how long it takes to to onboard a data management platform. And, and being more lightweight as well, talking about SMEs, you know, we kind of a, have this lightweight platform that, that actually can target uh, smaller use cases too, which might be, you know, a boutique uh, buy side firm. Uh, we do, we do uh, for now target you know, only the financial industry, but in the future, we do intend to spread out and also target other industries as well that have data management pain points. So uh, in the future, I think we'll, we'll kind of um, help other corporates and, and various other industries too. Oh, so James, you are, what, what you're trying to say is that uh, you are able to solve, okay, look, down here, we have got uh, two, two guys here who are rightly in the bank industry, Victor's with CIMB, I've been main So are you saying that uh, you're able to solve our the data monsters that's within us? You know, uh, we have decades of legacy data reservoir systems. Uh, you you know this better than anybody else. Uh, enhanced by layers and layers of stop gap. You know, we always have uh, enhancement of software to kind of stop gap, whatever it is. And then so we build layers and layers upon the original uh, call system, right? The original banking call system. So 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 you are you saying that Fencall is able to help these large monsters that we call banks in our database, uh, you know, help us to, to kind of uh, uh, um, ease 
into whatever we need to do? Yes, I think um, you know there's there's a there's a whole host of different use cases that our platform can help with. You know, the core engine is is sort of data agnostic. It could it could handle any type of you know, mm -hmm. data, market data, maybe static reference data, investment data, or uh, or even you know let's say business entities. If somebody wanted to uh, put some um, man automation around you know managing their business entities or their customer data, um, those kind of things could be then pass through our uh, rule engine and, and validated uh, and, and make sure it's all nice and clean and, and then pass down to downstream systems. And, and, and of course, if any exception is, is encountered when, when we're checking the data, we, we have the dashboards where a user can then uh, check. So just as an example, let's say for the past few days, we received the same price for a certain stock. Uh, that that could be a stale price, as it's known. Mm. That, that, that it's uh, uh, that something along the, the the path there is not updating the, to the correct price. But actually, it, on the other hand, it could also be a valid scenario. The price may have just not changed for that for the last three days. So that that uh, we can raise an exception that somebody can eyeball it and say yes, that's not that's not a problem. It's not nothing to be concerned about. Or on the other hand, somebody could then uh, make a change, and and then we have the built-in four I approval processes. So. And that's quite quite useful in the in the finance world, where you know compliance issues uh, compliance is very important. So not one person is allowed to make changes to the data. You have to have a second you know, colleague or boss that comes along and and validates that change. And and that that four I or six I approval process is out of the box in our software, rather than uh, having to be configured over a period of time. Mm, so so uh, James, is this is this is this some sort of AI machine learning thing you're using? So we do. We are looking at various ways to enhance the uh, the product with machine learning. One example of that is actually, you know, let's say you, you've hit the same type of exception uh, in, in many times now, and, and each time the the end users or the data management team make the same change in order to resolve that. So what we what we're doing is using machine learning to actually intelligently suggest that you know that the last few times that this uh, issue happened, you, you took this action. Do you just want to apply that? So with a single click. They can uh, apply that change much quicker, and so that, that we're targeting various ways of using machine learning to to speed up and allow asset management firms and banks to operate even more efficiently. Mm. Thanks for that. Uh, so now we we are we we, we, we last week itself uh, the the last weekend we also heard uh, from the regulators our MES uh, the announcement of four uh, you know uh, digital licenses two full digital and two wholesale licenses. So this is. I think I guess it's been long anticipating. We were anticipating this announcement since June. Uh, finally, it came in. So it came in December. So kind of timely. I'm gonna throw the ball back to Victor, who is, I mean, running a bank. All right, a brick and mortar. Albeit he has got uh, uh, you know some some of the tech stuff happening to CIMB. But Victor, what are your thoughts on uh, uh, these four upcoming Singapore digital banks uh, expected to operate sometime in 2022? Uh, how does it change the banking landscape in Singapore or the region or even specifically maybe SME since we are topic of SME going fintech uh, uh, today? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it will be exciting. I, I think earlier I talked about the gaps. Uh, and, you know, today, uh, big banks, we do we, we, we focus on the 80-20, right? And mm. there are always gaps uh, in the kind of offerings that uh, we provide. Um, so the virtual banks will come in and for sure be able to fill those gaps. Uh, where, whether it's SME, the long tail financing, uh, there are lots of areas where you know it's totally untapped. Uh, and being brick and mortar, you know, uh, has its issues because we have cost issues, and you know we will never have enough money to invest uh, in technology, right? Um, so, so I think to to partners uh, partner with the fintechs, I think uh, that was one of the questions. Uh, how do we go about doing that? Um, and for me, the mentality is um, firstly sharing the same kind of values. Uh, we need to be solving um, a common common uh, issue. Uh, so, so essentially, when, when two partners come together, we need to really share, share some common values. Um, and if you look at the, the UK, you know, open banking has been around already, but it hasn't really taken off. And we need to ask ourselves why. And for me, I allude that to being enterprise grade, right? Um, every fintech can want to partner with a bank, but the bank is a custodian of customer information, uh, and you know whether we are and we are totally regulated. Um, so essentially, the fintech that partner with us needs to be uh, really enterprise grade. You know, security must be really really strong. 
Uh, and then open banking can really bring uh, itself to life. Um, and I think recently with the, the Findex, uh, you know, mm. now you can tap all your, your information from all the other banks. And then really banks coming together, everybody having, you know, enterprise grade system, you know, uh, and and it's not penetratable. So 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 I think as fintechs try to partner partner with banks, uh, you need to get yourself to that level where you know the bank security uh, experts, you know, will be willing to open up those APIs, right? Mm -hmm. And opening APIs is not like uh, two years ago where we we're where branch locations are and bought FX rates, right? Um, those are not real uh, uh, integrations, um, and and I mean it will be quite interesting to see how Singtel and Grab come together, and then you know uh, a taxi hail, a taxi hailing and a, a, a telco, uh, two very different uh, characteristics of a bank of, of organizations come together and do something really special. Yeah, so so I think for us also. If, Everything that we do, and and when we partner our chatbot company, uh, Pen AI, for instance, and it took us just three weeks. Um, you know, first we had the same values. We wanted to solve the same problems. Uh, we wanted it fast. We don't need it to be perfect. You know, and I think that's a real mentality when we get into our partnerships. Uh, we all want to win together. Um, mm. We will not be perfect in any rollout, right? And we just have to be convicted to fix it as we move along. Um, I think speed is important. Uh, being fast is uh, so speed fast uh, and delivering and, and really having that as I said, the customer journey uh, and delivering the service to the customer. So Eva uh, for us uh, was a good example of how you know we answered all the COVID questions for the customers, help our customers through the application process, and essentially a chatbot created what we call a virtual relationship manager. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Victor, for, for that. Uh, those, those, those are wonderful insights. Uh, so we look forward to, uh, I guess, the four uh, bank license, uh, digital banks as well, and how we as the incumbent, uh, you know, we continue to compete with them. And I think we can bring this whole banking relationship forward uh, in the whole ecosystem. Now, we've got uh, just uh, slightly uh, less than four minutes left. Let's just let's have a quick run up, a summary of our discussions. Paul, Paul Haji, you're going to get the uh, the first uh, bite of the cherry. Uh, anything uh, to, to tell us out there, uh, the audience out there in terms of, SMEs in terms of uh, in terms of uh, large companies in terms of compliance and cybersecurity. Any last uh, 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 sharings, Paul? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think um, generally um, uh, well, the biggest thing that I tell companies is actually free advice that uh, helps uh, arguably the most is like mm -hmm. uh, having a security culture. Um, so investing in creating that security culture from the the CEO or the board on downwards. Um, and I think, you know, businesses that do that generally make better decisions uh, around security across the board, um, as long as the buy-in and the sort of interest from the executives as well as the board is there. Um, and when it's not, I've seen uh, a lot of uh, bad things sort of happen, right? So I think uh, if you're a small business or a big business, uh, making sure that security is an important part of the culture and the board uh, and executives are thinking about it and asking questions about it uh, to their, um, uh, um, mm. their, their team. Uh, that really kind of helps um, sort of ingrain the thought process is needed when you kind of like switch the the thought around your your business is, is your business actually being a target and making decisions based upon on that and what people could want uh, out of your business from a security perspective. Thanks, Paul and uh, Oliver Frexter two zero two one Frexter two zero two two. What can we expect? I, so I think the uh, finance and banking industry has been uh, heavily disrupted uh, the, during the last few years. Uh, the real estate industry is still very uh, backward. So I, I think uh, moving forward next year, Frexel will still uh, continue to penetrate this uh, market, try to expand the use of uh, fintech in the real estate investments, uh, and definitely, definitely try to do more deals, uh, bring on more users in uh, 2021. Yeah. Thank you, Oliver. And James, uh, friend call. Bank call two zero two one two zero two two. What can we expect? So yeah, we're we're hoping to to continue disrupting this this data management space and and really allowing financial institutions to become more agile and nimble when it comes to data because the data landscape is is constantly changing and evolving and you know if you want to add some new new fields to a particular um, data master for example it's really good if they can um, do that quickly and, and nimbly without having to. Uh, spend too much time on that. So uh, that's what we're hoping to help financial institutions with uh, next I year. Like it. 
Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, it's always nimble. It's always cost effective. And that's, that's what uh, Fanco is all about, right? And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the, the end of our session today. Uh, I'd like to just uh, give a special thanks to our, our wonderful rounds of panelists uh, with all the years of experience and, and, and traveling and living in different, different cities all over the world. Victor Lee, uh, please join me to thank uh, together uh, Mr. Victor Lee, CEO of CIMB, uh, Paul Haji, CEO and co-founder of Horagi, uh, Oliver Sia, co-founder and CEO of Frexter. Uh, Mr. James Crosby, CEO of uh, Fencor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for your wonderful insights and sharing here this afternoon over at uh, SSF's uh, uh, Singapore channel. And uh, hey, uh, my name is Mark Leong, uh, representing Singapore uh, Financial Association. And thank you so much for tuning in, guys. And until uh, we meet again, and uh, thank you so much. And we'll see you again very, very soon. And enjoy the rest of uh, Singapore FinTech Festival 2020, day four. Hey, we've got day four and day five to look forward to. Thank you, guys. And uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.